A camera is only as good as the person behind it, but we all started somewhere. Today, I wanna to talk about the best budget camera that you can buy as a beginner and what I wish I would have known before I bought my first camera. The cameras that are being released today are so good, it's hard to imagine where we will be at in five years from now. I'll be talking about several different cameras that you should consider if you are a beginner. I will be giving you photography and video examples all along the way so you can make the best decision. Some of the cameras I'll be talking about are fixed lenses, which means you cannot change the lens, you're just stuck with whatever the camera comes with, and other cameras are going to have interchangeable lenses, which are good if you want to have more creative freedom, but you will need to add those extra lenses to your budget. All of the cameras that I'll be covering with you today are under $700, and I've used them all in real-world applications in different lighting situations, and I would never recommend anything to you that I don't stand behind. I'm approaching this video as someone who might be a beginner. Maybe they have no idea what they're doing. They just want to open up the box and go out and start filming with it and creating content. But I'm not going to let you off the hook that easy because I'm not going to recommend any cameras that only have program auto exposure. I want every single camera that I recommend to have manual exposure because one day down the line, I want you to be able to use manual exposure to really get the best looking images out of your camera. If you've been in the market looking for your first camera, you know how overwhelming that can be. There's so many cameras that you could pick from and not all of the cameras at the same price point will give you the same functionality for what you're doing. I'm also taking into consideration that a lot of times many people can only buy one camera and so they wanna make sure that it's the right choice. But I have to tell you, if you're anything like me and you do end up getting the right camera, it could turn into a lifelong passion and hobby. Too many times I see many people buy a camera and they don't know how to use it and then it sits on their shelf and they move on to the next thing. I don't want that to happen to any of you guys. Now, if you're still undecided on which camera is best for you after I go through this entire list, I made a camera quiz that may help you get on the right track to figure out what camera is best for you. I'll leave a link to that quiz in the description. All right, we got a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time. I'm Joe and this is the Film Alliance. If you don't already follow me and you like videos like this, where we use cameras like these to make better videos, then make sure to join the Film Alliance by subscribing. The first camera on my list is the one that I'm most excited about, the Osmo Pocket 3. The Pocket 3 was released in October of 2023 and it costs $519 US body only. However, if you go a bit further with your budget and you pick up the Creator Combo Kit for an extra 150 bucks, you can also get an extra battery, the DJI Mic 2, which will enhance your audio by leaps and bounds, and a little wide angle lens. Now, if you plan on purchasing the Pocket 3 or you already own one, I created a course on how I set mine up for cinematic shooting, how I use it in different lighting environments, and how I get the most out of it, complete with project files. I'll leave a link to that course in the description. But for now, I'll tell you why I think it should be a contender if you're looking for a camera that fits all of your needs other than going underwater. The camera is built around a gimbal, so your footage will be much more stabilized than if you purchase a standard DSLR or mirrorless camera for more money and try to do some hand holding and walking shots. The Pocket 3 does not have digital stabilization. It's all mechanical, right from the gimbal. And if you ever used a gimbal on a traditional camera in the past, you would know how tough it is to not only attach the camera, but then to balance it every single time you go out to film with it. Not with the Pocket 3. If your footage is too shaky, it will be unusable, but you will never have that issue with the Pocket 3. It would be nice if DJI allowed us to have a little bit of a digital image stabilization to improve that up and down access, but the sensor just does not have enough area to do so. At least that's what I think. In many situations, the image quality from the Pocket 3 is going to be much better than a more expensive 8-bit camera. You could do anything with this camera. You could vlog with it, do videography, cinematic shots, product video, photography, green screen work, overhead shots, literally everything that I threw at it, it handled so well. It's a 10-bit camera, and if you don't know what that means, it will take a more detailed image than an 8-bit camera. This is important because when you get into challenging lighting situations, 8-bit cameras tend to easily blow out the highlights 
or dim out the darks and force you to shoot in almost optimal lighting conditions where a 10-bit camera like this gives you a lot more flexibility. Your images will almost always look great. The Pocket 3 has a nine megapixel sensor, so I'm not sure I would go out and purchase this camera if all I wanted to do was photography, but it's certainly great for video. It has a one inch sensor and it can shoot in 4K up to 120, which gives you a lot of resolution to play with in post-production. And your images will always be super high quality. It is a 20 millimeter fixed lens, so you don't need to worry about shopping for a lens after you pick up this camera. And you can really focus on your story rather than the best lens that fits on your camera. Word of caution, before you go out and purchase a Pocket 3 and shoot an entire day in 4K60 or 4K 120, make sure your editing rig can handle that footage because many people forget to think about that. You can hold it vertical and still get a horizontal shot, which makes it great for conspicuous filming if you're out in public. It also has face tracking, so if you're a solo content creator and you set up a tripod somewhere and you want the camera to follow you around, it's perfect and makes it look like somebody's holding the camera. It has active track, so I can tap on the screen and tell the camera what I want it to lock on, and then it will literally just lock on that subject and follow it wherever I take the camera. This is great for someone like me who likes to create product videos, especially when I create product shots for these types of YouTube videos. Before we move on, there's a few more small reasons why I love the Pocket 3. It charges so fast. I can charge the entire camera from zero to 100% in 21 minutes, and that battery will last me three quarters of a day of moderate shooting. If I needed that extra battery that comes with the Creator Combo Kit, now we're talking about a whole day, maybe a whole nother half a day. So I'd be able to shoot an entire day and then charge both the camera and the battery at night and go out and film the entire day again. The footage is easy to offload straight from the Pocket 3 onto my computer using the little USB-C port on the bottom of the Pocket 3. It's a great out of the box camera if you're a beginner. One thing that I must tell you about this camera is it only has two buttons, the joystick and the record button. Now the joystick has a couple different functional ways to use it other than just panning and tilting the gimbal head. But if you wanted more buttons for customization, then you'll have to go with the camera that I speak about later in the video. The Pocket 3 does have some moving parts, which means it will be pretty delicate and I'd hate for you to drop it on its head because I don't know how robust it actually is until I drop it. Also, the Pocket 3 is not weather resistant, so even one little drizzle could negatively affect its functionality. Unlike the next camera we're gonna speak about, the GoPro Hero 12. GoPro cameras are known for being people's first beginner camera, so it's one that I highly recommend. The GoPro Hero 12 is my most recent purchase and the most affordable camera in this video. It was released in September of 2023, and as of the time of filming this, you can buy it for $399 US. However, after you buy the SD card, you're looking at more about 420, 430. And I forgot to mention the SD card with the Osmo Pocket 3. That does not come with an SD card. And make sure you get the right SD card for both this camera and the Pocket 3, because if you don't, you won't be able to film in higher resolutions. But I'll leave all of the right SD cards in the description so you don't have to fumble around with that. Still, after you purchase the SD cards, it's not bad for what you get. The Hero 12 Black has an upgraded battery life, which I know from previous action cameras that I've owned do not last that long. Like this Osmo Action, the first one that they released, DJI, didn't have the best battery life in the world and had to buy an extra battery. But as a beginner, you wanna think about the content you're creating and not get stressed out when you see you only have 10% battery left and you just got started. They market the Hero 12 to record continuous 5K60 for over 70 minutes or 1080p 30 frames per second video for over an hour and a half. If you're a beginner and you wanna shoot fast paced, semi-dangerous shots, knowing that it's a good rugged camera without risking the delicate nature of its body like the Pocket 3, then this is your camera. By the way, if you like videos like this one, make sure to like this video so I know to make more videos like this one. Now the Hero 12 has digital stabilization, unlike the Pocket 3, which is good and it's bad. It's advanced stabilization and hyper smooth 6.0 technology will give you great looking smooth footage if you use it in the proper lighting environments. If you go into a low light environment or a low light situation, you're gonna get a weird motion blur looking artifact that you cannot fix in post-production. The GoPro Hero 12 Black is more of an outdoorsman camera or for someone who goes into the water. But a really cool thing that the digital stabilization has in the GoPro is 
is it will fix your horizon. So even if you twist and turn a little bit like this, you'll still get a steady horizon. That makes the GoPro great for vlogging. Just try to avoid those low light situations. It can capture 27 megapixel raw still photos, shooting 5.3K 60 frames per second, or 4K up to 120, and 2.7K up to 240, which means you can have a lot of creative options while you're filming with it. You can shoot between 8-bit and 10-bit, just like I said with the Pocket 3, except I would always shoot in 10-bit if I could. This camera is easy to use. You can unbox it, insert the SD card, charge it, and just go out and start filming with it without any knowledge. Like every camera, there's always ways to maximize the image quality, and the more you use it, the better you get at it. I would pull out the GoPro if I was shooting low angle shots, if I was traveling with it, or even creating YouTube channel videos, or I wanted to get some behind the scenes shots, or maybe put it on my chest so you could see what I'm doing with the camera in front of me. I'm in the process of creating a course for the GoPro Hero 12, and I'll leave that course in the description once it's done. One negative aspect to the GoPro 12 is that they removed the GPS, which is still on the GoPro 11. So if you need a GPS, go with the GoPro 11, which is $120 cheaper, and it might be a better option. Another thing to remember is action cameras generally have less buttons on the outside of the camera, so you can't customize it as much as if you had a bigger body camera, like this next camera we speak about. Now it may not be an action camera or have a gimbal attached to it, but it's a pocket sized and super popular camera for content creators and vloggers. The ZV-1F was released in October of 2022 and it costs $499 US. I was able to use it in all different types of lighting situations and environments. I went out when it was night, I went out when it was dusk, dawn, and then right when it was bright out. I also shot with it indoors in S-Log3 and I wasn't getting the best results. So I would recommend either shooting in Cine2 or just the normal color profile if you decide to pick up the ZV-1F and you are a beginner. I have to say that I was pretty impressed with it. I think it's great for beginners because the ZV-1F has a lot more buttons and dials on the outside of the camera than say the Pocket 3 or the GoPro. This means you have more control over your exposure and quick settings rather than having to dive into the menu system than using the swipe function on the display to find what you're looking for. It has a one inch sensor and a 20 millimeter equivalent fixed wide angle lens just like the Pocket 3, which is great contender for someone who wants a little bit more of a traditional looking camera that has a fixed lens on it. It comes with a flip out three inch touchscreen and a directional three capsule microphone for front facing recording. However, based on my tests for me using it in real world situations, I found that it's always best to buy an external audio mic because you're always going to get better audio than the native mic inside of the camera. One of the reasons why I think a beginner would really appreciate the ZV-1F is it has things like product showcase mode. The Pocket 3 has that too, but the ZV-1F does it better where you can actually hold something in front of the camera and it automatically focuses on that and unfocuses on your face or whatever's in the background. Background defocus also is another little function that you get with the ZV-1F. It's basically a modified aperture as of yet and it has real-time eye autofocus. Out of these three cameras, the ZV-1F will give you the fastest autofocus. After all, Sony is known for their autofocus systems. But one thing Sony's not known for is the stabilization in body, other than the ZV-E1. Other than that, most of their cameras give you pretty bad stabilization if you just try to walk with the camera instead of putting them onto a gimbal. Another neat feature is it has face priority auto exposure. In other words, it will expose for your face rather than the entire frame. So it'll make sure that your face is always exposed correctly if you're doing something like vlogging. I do think the ZV-1F is great for someone who might be a beginner who wants to learn more about cameras and get a little bit more into that manual exposure realm. It has a 20 megapixel sensor. So if you wanna get into photography, you have that option as well. The Sony ZV-1 series comes in three flavors, the ZV-1 Mark I, the ZV-1 Mark II, and the ZV-1F. I've shot a lot with all of those cameras, which are slightly different from each other. The ZV-1 Mark I has a 24 to 70 millimeter f1.8 to 2.8 lens, giving it more zoom capabilities. That makes the ZV-1 Mark I the best camera for overall zoom distances. The ZV-1F has a 20 millimeter fixed lens, the same as the Pocket 3, which makes it a great vlog camera. All three ZV-1s have a mic port and HDMI out, which means you'll have more room to do actual client work if you ever decide to do that down the road. Whereas the Pocket 3 and the GoPro 12, you don't get those 
those functions. Also, the stabilization in all three of those ZV-1 cameras are not even comparable to the GoPro Hero 12 or the Pocket 3. So if you want great stabilization, then go with those two previous cameras or buy a gimbal for your ZV-1, or you could throw this footage through Catalyst Browse, but that does add an extra step to your workflow when it comes to editing. One negative to the ZV-1F, the ZV-1 Mark 1, and the Mark 2 is they are 8-bit cameras and they can only shoot in 4K up to 30 frames per second. If you want to go shoot 4K up to 60, then you'll have to go with the Pocket 3 or the GoPro. I actually made videos about all of these cameras and I went into great detail about them, so if you want to dive more into these cameras, I'll leave those videos in the description. But before we go on any further, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, PGY Tech. They sent me over this OneGo Solo V2 camera bag about a month ago and they said, use it as you normally would use it and tell us how you like it. As a side note, one of my main camera bags is also a PGY Tech bag, which is the OneMo 2 bag. So I'm familiar with PGY Tech and their products and their durability. It's good quality. They also sent me over two other bags, the OneGo and the OneGo shoulder bag for quick on the go filming. And the OneGo bag I ended up actually using as an alternative to that DJI tote bag that comes with the Creator Combo Kit. But this sponsor mentioned is about the OneGo Solo V2. It has an expansive opening so it's easy to look in and quickly to get what you need. It has dividers that give you a clutter-free experience for better organization. The shoulder pad makes it easy and comfortable to carry around. And if you're someone like me and you want to fit everything into a smaller bag rather than lug it around an oversized bag, then that's what I'm doing. So if you need a quick on-the-go bag that you can throw a pretty good amount of stuff inside of it and still be able to move fast, then pick up this bag. I'll leave a link to it in the description. Now back to our video. The APS-C Canon R50 was released in April of 2023 and is currently selling for $579 US body only or $699 with an 18 to 45 millimeter kit lens. For those of you who have shot with Canon, the colors are more bright and vibrant than what you get with other cameras. I think Canons are so popular for being great beginner cameras because they're so easy to use and navigate when you jump into their menu systems. I found the same to be true with the Canon R50. It was an absolute breeze to pick it up and just go out and start shooting with it. Especially when I compare it to my older Sony cameras that have those older, harder to navigate menu systems. This camera and the rest of the cameras on this list are interchangeable lens cameras. So you will be able to change out different lenses with these cameras, but that will add an extra price tag to your budget. Also that might create a little bit of anxiety after you pick your camera and now you have to pick your lens, which is sometimes harder than the actual camera itself. You really have to ask yourself, what are you shooting? And in most cases, when you get the proper lens for the proper situation, your videos and images will turn out way better than if you went with a fixed lens camera. So there are pros and cons to interchangeable lens cameras compared to fixed lens cameras, and that's just one of them. I still have yet to meet a wedding videographer other than Matt Johnson, who doesn't shoot with Canons only. I wasn't planning on shooting weddings, but if I was to get this camera, why not have it? And if a wedding came up, then hey, at least I had a Canon to shoot it. It has a 24 megapixel sensor and can shoot in 4K up to 30 frames per second. If you wanted a camera that could shoot great photography, then this would be your camera, or at least the camera that I talked about in this video. While shooting with this camera, I really appreciated the R50's more traditional look and it's better hand grip than the smaller cameras that I've used in the past. This will be one of the biggest cameras on the list, but sometimes people like the way a camera feels in their hand compared to something smaller or more delicate. One incredible thing about the Canon R50 that I really enjoyed was the 10-bit HDR video. I was shocked to see how good the images looked out of the R50 compared to that 8-bit ZV-1 footage. One thing important to remember when you start to talk about these bigger bodied cameras is they'll have more ports for things like microphone input or headphone jacks so you can monitor the audio or HDMI out so you can record externally or even monitor externally as well down the road. Make sure to pay attention to stuff like that when you're making your decision on which camera is best for you because you're gonna wanna grow one day and you don't wanna be stuck not being able to do this extra stuff that you may need to do in the future, depending on what you're filming. The Canon R50 does not have a headphone port, but it does have a mic jack and an HDMI out. But when we talk about APS-C camera, there's something that you have to make sure you understand between the different camera manufacturers. With Sony APS-C cameras, you get a 1.5 times crop full frame equivalent. But with Canon cameras, you get a 1.6 times crop. So for example, if you're using a 20 millimeter lens on the end of your Canon R50, that's really the equivalent of a 36 millimeter lens full frame equivalent. When I first started out, I ended up getting a 50 millimeter lens for a Canon T3i. And for some reason it was so punched in, I was like, there's something wrong with this lens because it was giving me like an 80, what is that? 
It's 86 millimeters focal length and I had to get really far away from it in order to get the frame right. What I didn't know at the time was that it was an APS-C camera. So if I wanted to get a 50 millimeter focal length, then I should have gone with something like a 30 millimeter lens. I was also having an issue with Canon's lens choices compared to what you get with something like a Sony. Sony has a lot more lens options than Canon does and that could pose a problem if you wanted to get a few different lenses for your Canon R50 compared to what you could get with the Sony. Also, that's gonna mean that your Canon lenses are going to be more expensive than something that would fit on a Sony. That brings us to the next camera, the Sony ZV-E10. The ZV-E10 was released in July of 2021 and is currently selling for $698 US body only or $798 with the 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens. Or is that 16 to 55? 16 to 50 kit lens. I've owned mine since it was released around there and I've loved every single minute of it. I wouldn't say the kit lens will showcase the ZV-E10's true potential. Definitely go out and get yourself a better lens like the Sigma 18 to 50, but this camera will give you great image quality, especially if you put the right glass on it. I made a video about the different lenses that you could use with the ZV-E10 or other APS-C cameras, and I'll leave that video in the description, but it really depends on what you're using it for. If you're using it for vlogging, then I would go with the Viltrox 13 millimeter F1.4 or the Sony 11 millimeter F1.8. And if you're a run and gun shooter, then I would use the Sigma 18 to 50 f 2.8. But if you understand what you're shooting and what your needs are, then the ZV-E10 really shines. Just like the Canon R50, it has a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor and it can shoot in 4K up to 30 frames per second, but it does only shoot in 8-bit. I actually made a comparison video between the ZV-E10 and the R50, and I put a lot of side-by-side -side image comparisons in that video, so do you guys have a good idea of how different they are? I'll leave that video in the description. The ZV-E10 is an 8-bit camera, just like the ZV-1, but it has an APS-C sensor, which means you're gonna get a lot more better performance in low light situations than you would with a one inch sensor. APS-C sensors perform much better than the Pocket 3, the GoPro, or even the ZV-1 in low light environments. So if you're shooting in low light environments, an APS-C camera may be the way to go. If you want a fast autofocus system, then the ZV-E10 would be your camera. Just like the ZV-1, you can customize the outside of it. It has several buttons and dials, which gives you the ability to toggle between different settings that you choose quickly. Out of these cameras, I found that this one will challenge you and help you understand how to film with cameras and the technical side of cameras the most, especially how to work your exposure. It does have an older menu system, but I've become proficient using it and just communicating with it and understanding how it works. If you already owned the ZV-E10, then I made a video about how I set mine up for cinematic settings. Maybe you saw it already, but I'll leave that one in the description in case you want to know how to set up your ZV-E10. The ZV-E10 would be great for a beginner who wants to jump into client head shoots or do something like astrophotography. I've used the ZV-E10 for both niches and it's gotten me some great results. It has a mic port, a headphone port, and an HDMI out for those of you who want to record externally and have that backup recording. Now the big negative to the ZV-E10 is it has terrible rolling shutter. If you plan on moving with it or putting a longer lens on it, you'll have to keep it on a monopod or a tripod because once you start to move it a little bit, the background just becomes jello. So you'll have to make sure you compensate for that on what you're shooting and what lens you decide to pick up. I promise for the first couple of months that I had it, I didn't really notice it until people started to comment about it and then I started to see it and I couldn't unsee it. So I'm sorry if I'm breaking any bad news to you. I noticed it when I started shooting with longer lenses like a 55 to 210 lens or moving the camera back and forth or even vlogging with it. Even with a wide angle lens, I was still getting some pretty bad rolling shutter. So what does that make it good for? It makes it good for standing still shots, not really moving with it unless you know you're moving slow with it. You could turn stabilization off and then throw your footage through Catalyst Browse, which is Sony's clip management system, but that's just an extra step in post-production. So that makes it difficult. Now, if I threw this onto a gimbal and I put a wide lens on it, I wouldn't have any issue with it, but it doesn't change the fact that it is a great little entry level camera. This camera is really for someone who might be into storytelling or want to understand how it all works. The ZV-10 is one of the fastest selling content creator cameras, and that's for good reason. It produces outstanding quality. Of course, the lens on the end of it will dictate how much better your image will look, but just like recently in my latest video where I compared the Pocket 3 to the ZV-E10, I think the ZV-E10 beats the Pocket 3 out in image quality if you have the proper lens on it. But if you only have the kit lens on it, I would say go with the Pocket 3. But if you want an overall Swiss army knife of cameras, then go with this next one. 
The Nikon Z30 was released in June of 2022 and it's currently selling for $606 body only or $696 with a 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens. The Nikon Z30 was comparable to the ZV-E10 and it was much cheaper. It's just not as great of a video camera as it is a fantastic stills camera. With its kit lenses and the new 24 millimeter F1.7 and the 40 millimeter F2, that would be everything that you needed if you wanted to be a hybrid shooter. When I shot with it, I was like, wow, the image quality is insane. Better than the ZV-E10 footage. The pictures I was getting were also very impressive. It has that articulating screen, which is perfect for vloggers. I forgot to mention the ZV-E10 does too. It also has a tally light for videographers. So that's always super helpful to know when you're recording rather than just thinking you're recording and then finding out 25 minutes later that you're not. It has a 20 megapixel sensor and it can shoot in 4K up to 30. I also tested this camera against the ZV-E10 so I could compare those two images. I'll make sure to leave that video in the description as well. I'm tempted to call this little APS-C camera the Swiss army knife of cameras because the image that it produced was just great. It has a variety of buttons on the outside of it, which will help beginners quickly customize the outside of their camera to their liking for quicker access to their settings. The layout of the buttons and the dials also will match other higher up Nikon cameras, which makes it easier for people who are kind of growing in the Nikon realm. They're not gonna have a big learning curve when they go from camera to camera as they grow. The only thing I found I don't know, maybe I wasn't doing the settings right, was the autofocus system seemed to be super slow with the Nikon Z30. I mean, autofocus was pretty good, but it wasn't the best. And it is important to have a fast autofocus system as a beginner because you don't wanna be trying to film something and having things come in and out or focus pumping. I mean, I'm in fast paced environments a lot, so I need my autofocus to be fast, especially the eye autofocus. Now it does have eye autofocus and animal autofocus. So if you're a wildlife photographer, this would be your camera. It also lacks a headphone jack, but other than that, the Z30 is perfect for beginners and anyone who wants a camera that's easy to use and produces great results. All all of these cameras are great cameras and they all have different uses. The GoPro has the advantage of being much more rugged and being able to go underwater. The Pocket 3 is good for quick, on-the-go, cinematic looking shots. It has fantastic low light capability. The ZV-1F is great for anyone who wants to just go out and be a vlogger with a traditional looking camera. It has a port on the side and a lot of customization on the outside of the body of the camera. The R50 is great for anyone who wants to get into both photography and video and have a bigger size body to have a better grip. The ZV-E10 has great autofocus and a bunch more lens options than you'll get with the Canon line or the Nikon line. And your lenses will generally be cheaper. But the Nikon is perfect for anyone who wants to jump into content creation, have a good stills camera, and shoot decent video. All right, let me know if I missed anything or if there's a camera out there that you think might be better for beginners. And let me know what camera you ended up going with. I hope this video wasn't too long, but I tried to cover all of the ground and tell you everything that I could about these cameras to help you really on your journey. I wish I would have watched this video before I bought my first camera, but I didn't know any of this stuff, so how would I have made this video? All right, I'm Joe with the Film Alliance. Thanks for watching. See you on the next video.